Now, when I think about the will of God, I, this, Sister Barb assigned this one to me, and, and I thought, well, this is going to be a fairly easy one to talk about, you know, because I've thought about this one all of, practically all of my life. When, uh, when I was in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship uh, back in college, this was one of the, uh, the main things that they talked about, getting to know the will of God for your life. And what they meant by that was, you know, uh, what, getting to know whether you should be, a, you know, a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or, or who you should marry, you know, and what's, the, what's some advice about marrying and what are some tips on knowing the will of God. You know, that, I remember this, uh, one, one of the things are like, there's three tips. That you, I don't remember what the tips were, but this one <laughs> brother had three three tips. They had three tips that you could know that it's the will of God. I'll just tell you that the will of God isn't like that. You know, God doesn't deal with tips. You know, he doesn't give you tips. You know, he, 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 actually, he actually brings you into his will, see, and you, and you know his will. You actually know his will, see, so he doesn't, you're not, it's not a matter of, uh, like, like uh, it's, not, it's not a matter of tips at all. Now, uh, my opening comments are, uh, I guess I would I have some things that I've, I've just thought of, of on my own here. And of course, uh, you that are uh, Berean-like, I'm asking you to search the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so, and, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll thrash, thrash these things out and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. But, I, but these are like within the confines of, of like him in whom we move, and have our being, you know. Now, there's at least two levels at which you could think about that. Now, when Paul uh, talked about that on Mars Hill, he was actually talking about, uh, the, he was talking about the Athenians there. He said, he actually talking about everybody, every, everybody, all the sons of Adam in whom we live and move and have our being. But see, now in Christ, we, we have been brought up to another level, see. We brought, and, and in whom we live and move, and have our being. See, so, see now, so this is a, this is a, a, a very real transition that has taken place in Christ, and, and it's, um, but the same words could apply to both uh, situations. Now, uh, d- let me just give you some opening thoughts here. God's will, among other things, is the revealer of who he is, what he is like, what he is engaged in, particularly as it pertains to us. Now, let me just uh, say this at the beginning, that actually most of what the scripture says about God's will doesn't pertain to us directly. You know, it's, it's mostly about God's will. It's mostly about God. You know, it's about, it's about God. It, it's actually about God, and it's about Christ. God's will, you know, it's the largest, you know, when you talk about the, big, the largest uh, spectrum of un, of consideration is actually God himself when we talk about God's will. It's not, it isn't, you know, it's not down here. You know, it's actually most of the will is up there, you know, and, and, and some of it, some of it extends down here, right? And some of it has a bearing down here, but, but most of the will, most of his will has to do with, you know, with his, uh, with himself. We're going to talk about that. And with his son and with the Holy Spirit, with the holy angels, cherubim, seraphim, God's will. See, that's uh, see these uh, these are these have to do with God's will too. They're hearkening unto the voice of His word. See, these are anyhow. The will of God is the engine that drives all that God does. If you can think about it like that, whatever God does, He does it because He wants to. There's nothing that God does he, that He does because He doesn't want to. And whatever God, God doesn't want to, he doesn't do. So, so we can assume that everything that God does, he wants to, see? And that actually is, pertains to us. I'm going to develop this a little bit more. The, uh, the will of God is the determiner of all that we know of him. There are things that are revealed to his person and character, and there are secret things. And he, God's will is what has determined what we know of him and what we don't know of him. And his will also determines what we can know of him. Think about that. There are things that, see, there are things that you, 
that are yet can be explored and, and entered into, see, and God is, he's left this vista open, see, about under, understanding his will. The, the will of God has provided us with all of our capacities to perceive and comprehend things seen and unseen, but particularly him. God has given you eyes to see him. And God has given you ears to hear him. And God has given you a mouth to speak to him, see? And God has given you a f feet to labor for him, right? He's given you arms and, and, and hands to, to labor for him. See, this is, uh, this is primarily, see, all, any other usage is secondary. It's not saying it's wrong, but, but see, these are the, this is the primary thing it was given for. See, it was, it was for that purpose. Now, the will of God has given us the necessary capacities to comprehend his eternal power and Godhead, which make men of none excuse for not seeking after him. So, so here now we're talking about these capacities. Now, you know, in Romans chapter 1, that they might know his eternal power and Godhead. Now, God gave men the capacities. He gave men even the capacities to consider these. Fallen men, he gave fallen men the capacities even to consider these things, see? His eternal power and Godhead. The will of God has at times dispensed to us an abundance of provisions and necessities whereby acceptable service may be rendered unto him and yet at other times at his discretion he has allocated to men grievous necessities, tribulations, afflictions, persecutions, troubles, that men may look unto him as the eyes of the servants under the hand of their masters, and that men may commit the keeping under their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator, right? That's, a, that's the will of God. That, incidentally, that is the will of God that men do that. That they, this, this is the will of God. You want to know what the will of God is? It's that you should keep your, your you should commit the keeping of your soul to him in well-doing. That's how you do it. See, sometimes that's all you can do is, is just do something. You do something that's well, you know, is well-pleasing to God. Like believe. Like trusting in him. See, in well-doing. So, or just anything that you know that is well-pleasing well to him, you commit your soul to him. See, so sometimes that's all you can do. Sometimes God brings you to the point where that's all you can do. Amen. Now, with regard to, to what we know of him, we know that we know what we, what we know because God willed it. And God is unknowable apart from the purposed revelation of himself. In the gospel, we are given to see that his discretionary revelation of himself is made in the person of Jesus Christ, his beloved son, and by discretionary revelation, we're saying that God does not cast his pearls before swine. So now, you know, Jesus said, remember in, in Matthew 11, uh, 27, he said, all things are given to me of my father. Yes. Remember that? Yes. And uh, he said that no man knoweth the father save the son. Yes. No man knoweth the son save the father. And and he to whom the Son will reveal him. See, so it's discretionary, see. But it's, but it's not like, well, I wonder if I'm going to get in or not. No, the, ver the very next verse says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. See, if, you're among, if you find yourself in that, among that group, if you find yourself in that condition, that you're, you find yourself to be heavy laden. I'm talking about heavy laden with sin. I don't mean with financial burdens I don't, I, or, or things like, a, like job loss. I'm talking about you're heavy laden because of your standing before God. You're, you're just very much concerned about your own standing before God. You're, you're heavy laden. Jesus says, come unto me. You, you come to me and, and I'm going to take care of this. See, You just come to me. Jesus says, come to me. Okay. Now, God created the worlds as an arena for the outworking of his eternal purpose in Christ because he willed to do it. And God created this arena as a showcase of aspects of his person heretofore unknown 
by principalities and powers in heavenly places simply because he willed to do it. That's the only reason. See, see we, like right now, we're here because God willed it. I, and I, I'm not, I'm, I, I suppose we can get, I'm not trying to be legalistic or anything, but I'm, I'm, I hope that you can, I hope you can see where I'm, uh, where I'm coming from here. So, and God will, God will send his son into the world to be the, he, he sent his son in the, to the world to be the propitiation for our sins because he willed to do it. It's important to see this because God willed to do it. It's important to see that you know, you, you know in your heart that God wanted to do it. He wanted to do it, see? See, now you, 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 it's one thing to know that Jesus did it. It's another thing to know that God wanted this to be done, see? And you've got to settle it, you've got to settle it in your heart to be so. You really have to come to the point where you actually can see this. You actually can see that Jesus not only did it, but God wanted him to do it, see? And see, now that's where you have, this is where confidence comes in. Confidence in God, because it's all, it all goes back to God himself. And God will send his son the second time to gather his elect and to induct the new and eternal order because he wills to do it. Now, uh, let's just go on here. It was God uh, who created the worlds by Christ Jesus. It was God who gave the law at Mount Sinai by the disposition of angels. It was God who sent the holy prophets. It was God who sent his son into the world, his son being the express image of his person. And he maketh and the brightness of the Father's glory. But in all these things, God did it because he wanted to do it. See, it's important to, for us to see this matter of God's will, that he, see, this, see we, we live because God wants, even to this moment, brethren, because, because just think of we're here. God wanted it. Now, uh, let's just talk for a moment about what I've called God talk. This is, uh, this is a word that Brother Fred used to use, God talk. And uh, so, as compared to the way men talk, okay, so this is, uh, so that we, uh, we have, we're confronted in the world with two different uh, vocabularies, uh, one that is aptly suited for giving expression to the high and lofty work of the God revealed in the scripture, the other which is only suitable for describing men's lowly and benighted assessment of things which we sometimes call the language of the street, right? So that's, uh, we've got other names we could call it too, but that's uh, jargon, you know, religious jargon. See, some, some people, so anyhow, but let's think about this. God purposes, but men make plans. Men plan with no assurance that they will, what they have planned will come to fruition. God, you know, <laughs> You know, men, you, you've seen that this, uh, I'm sure you've seen it, that God has a plan for your life, right? I'll tell you, God doesn't have a plan for your life. God has an eternal purpose that he's summoning you to be part of, see? He doesn't have a plan for your life, not for, not for you in, individual. He has, he's, got a, he's got a purpose that he's summoning all men everywhere to, to partake of, see? So, and, and so this is a, and then, God has an eternal purpose, but men can at best have a plan. And God, being eternal, has appointed a time for man upon earth, and men are shut up to live within those boundaries. That's just, that's just the way it is. And God determines, but wise men confess, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that, right? And God determines, but men make decisions. I'll tell you, God doesn't make decisions. See, when you talk about God making decisions, see, that's bringing God down to, to the language of the street. God doesn't make decisions. God determines, see? See, that's, uh, we, we want to talk, you wanna, when you talk about God, you want to talk in God talk, see? We want to talk, we want to talk, we want to represent the king. 
with, a, with the right vocabulary. God declares immutable, immutable decrees, but men make propositions. Some are good, some are not. God, declare, uh, God is long-suffering, whereas men are at best patient and kind with flaws in their patience and kindness because of sin. It's flawed. See, when you talk about the character of men, it's flawed. I don't even, even believing them. Their, their character is flawed. See, now, we're, we're not saying this to, to cast reproach. We're just saying we're making a contrast with God. See, we're, we're contrasting with the way things are right now with the way God is. See, so God is the high and lofty one, but men are base, or at best, they are meek and lowly. And the Lord shall endure forever, but men are like the grass of the field. How about that? The counsel of the Lord shall stand forever, but men's hearts can at best devise their own ways, right? And then uh, God knows the end from the beginning, but with men they know not what a day may bring forth. And all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do, but in the case of men it must be said that we know in part, right? Of men it is declared that they know not what a day may bring forth. But I'll tell you, God knows the end from the beginning. He sees it. He knows it. He's purposed it. Amen. Now, there are parts of uh, God's will that only he enters into. Now, this is what uh, I think people that have a surface uh, understanding of God, they, they fail to consider. They, when they, when they, in other words, people, a lot of people, when they think of the will of God, they just think about how it pertains to men. And, uh, of course, eventually, we've got to see how it pertains to men. We, we do. But, but, but there is a sense in which God's will originates with him. He willed it. It originates in his own purpose, right? He said, he said in the beginning, he said, let us make man. He said he was making, had a, this was the first conference here in the, in Genesis chapter one there. So remember the, the divi first divine conference that we have on, that's revealed, right? Let us make man in our image, right? So, but, but God was one, one of the persons of the Godhead was uttering that, right? And, and the other were the us, right? So let us, let us, one was driving that, maybe that's not the best word to use, but one was le one was in the one was determining that right one was the determiner of that of that utterance right let us make man his will originates with in his with and in his very person he wills and purposes and it is done what he wills and purposes is not in the least whimsical or capricious Otherwise, men would have no grounds for trusting in him. See, now, this is important to see about God's will, that the, char the, the character and nature of God's will, that his will is entirely trustworthy. His will, his will is, is his, what, what he wills and what he reveals. See, God, isn't, God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't. We, 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 he's actually, he's not only promised, but he's actually taken an oath. He's actually taken an oath so that we would be persuaded. We would be persuaded it was for our sakes that he, he took this oath. You know, there in, in, back there in Genesis, speaking with Abraham, by myself I have sworn. Remember he said that, that, that this promise is going to come to fruition. See, so God, God swear, he's sworn with an oath. See, and so, and so we're, we're, our, our confidence in, is in God because he's, he's absolutely trustworthy. He's absolutely constant, see? And what he has will, see, he, is, he's not, he doesn't change his mind, see? His, uh, see. From this uh, perspective, our salvation and our very being hang on the very trustworthiness and steadfastness of, his, of the nature of his will. Now, let's think about this. Our, our great moment-by-moment -moment indebtedness to the will of God. I'll just tell you, this, these are some, some new, uh, some, some thoughts that I've had uh, of just recently that uh, just think, our days, our moments, our breath, 
our being, our continuance to this hour, our happiness, our joys, our trials, our afflictions are all by the will of God. See, we're, right now, you take the breath you're taking, it's by the will of God. I'm not, I, I, think, I, think we could, I think I could establish that in the scripture. See, in him, in him we live and move and have our being. See, it's within, we're, we're speaking within those, within those confines. See, so this is, this is what we're talking about. And what we call the creation or the, or the universe, as some men call it, is by the will of God. It's continuing by the will of God. And it's, uh, of course, it's all things hold together by the, by the Son of God, right? The, he's all, by him all things consist, right? But this is by the will of God. All things consist by Christ, but it's by the will of God that they consist, see? And the arena of where the purpose of God in Christ Jesus is presently being carried forward is by the will of God. This arena that we're in. Christ was delivered for our offenses by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, as Brother Pat ministered to us. Incidentally, Brother Bob gave an introduction to my sermon because uh, he was uh, talking about the will of God towards the end, and I thank you, Brother Bob, for that. Uh, um, and the gospel of our salvation has come to us by the will of God. And we have been given a, a blessed Savior by the will of God. We have a great high priest who is able to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities by the will of God, because God willed it. God wanted it. This is, it's the only reason. That's the only reason we have it. The only reason we have the Savior is because God wanted it. God wanted it. See, it's weird. Actually, there's a sense in which our faith rests in the fact that God, God wanted This is what God wanted, right? We can actually, it actually boils down to that. These things that we, these benefits of our salvation actually have all come to us because God wanted it. God wanted it, see? And we have a blessed hope of the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior by the will of God. Now, there are parts of God's will that only the Lord Jesus Christ is able to enter into. Now, and I'm saying this because, now here we've been talking about things that only, prior to this, only things that God is able to enter into, but now let's think about things that, you know when men talk about the will of God, they very frequently, they, don't, they never get up above the level of what, how it applies to me. What's the, le, what's the will of God for your life? Now, now we're going to get to that eventually, but, but let's, let's see that there's, there's part of the will. There, see, and what we've talked about so far the will of God as it pertains to himself and the will of God as it pertains to Christ, there's no way that you could enter into it. It's like Brother Bob was ministering about the, you, touching, the, you know, touching the, uh, the, the altar, right? With the, you see, you, you can't enter into that. See, this is, this is his work. This is their work, see? There's a part of God's will that's only their work. It's what they do, right? But this is the foundation for our, for, for our hope. See, this is... Uh, now these parts of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that only he is, parts of the will of God that only Christ is able to enter into, remember, uh, he, he has performed and he yet performs and executes them. The Lord Jesus Christ, I delight to do thy will, O God. Now actually, you know, uh, Jesus is our example in this because we can actually delight in doing the will of God. This is, you know, if you haven't come to the place where you found a delight in doing the will of God, I exhort you to, to press on. There's more to be seen. There's more to see. See, there's a, so the, because it's just, in thy presence, there is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Do you think those pleasures were just for God? Do you think, you think he told us about those just for his own enjoyment? Or do you think that maybe he told us about them because men would eventually become partakers of them? See, so this is, a, so here's the. Now, it was by the will of God that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We had nothing to do with that. It was by the will of God that 
men would behold Christ's glory. And it was by the will of God that Christ, who knew no sin, was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And it was by the will of God that subsequent to his resurrection from the dead, Christ would be exalted to the right hand of God to give repentance and remission of sins, says there in the text to Israel. But he's doing this now to, to all men who are, it, we've been grafted into their olive tree, right? So, but he's, so he's, he's been exalted to give repentance and remission of sins. And it's by the will of God that Christ gave himself for our sins. And he went, he, went, he, he went away again the second time. Think about this now. Jesus went away. This is in the garden. He went away again the second time and pray, O oh my Father, if this cup may not, be pass, may, may not pass from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Now here's what I want to draw your attention to is that at this point, now here, this is where the, the Son of God and the Son of Man. See, here Jesus is the Son of God, right? This is where we're speaking about his identification with us. Now here at this particular point in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, he had to wrestle and bring his will into conformity to God's will. There was no other, uh, there's been no other time in uh, either eternity past or eternity future when this will occur. See this, uh, see this was, but here, here, but, but see now here's his identification with us. If we, if we can see it from that, that perspective of his identification with us. And then he said, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of, of me to do thy will, O God. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now, let's think about this. Now, we talk about the things that have, trans have been accomplished in, in, in the doing of the will of God by Christ. Now, Christ, in doing the will of God, actually took away the first covenant. He actually took away this approach to God where men are trying to, to come to God by their own merits. Jesus took it away. He took it away that he might establish the second. See, the second, the second covenant is the way, the way where men come to God by, because of their awareness of what God has accomplished in their behalf. See, they're, they're living by faith. They're trusting in God for their salvation because they know that he has made the abundant provision through his beloved son. See, so, so he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. And then there are parts of the, of the will of God that only the Holy Spirit is able to enter into. Just think about, he effectualizes what the Father and the Son have done. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God and for the heirs of salvation. And then we have here in Romans 8.27 that uh, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now that's a, that's a, pretty, that's a very critical operation that's going on all the time. See, and men, we should, we should not be dull about, we should, uh, if, if we sense that we're dull to these things, we should repent and ask for grace. Lord, sh show me more of this. I, I want to see, I want to be more tender about, I want to be more aware and tender about these things and uh, and see that so these are things that we don't this this is not not just our doctrine quote unquote I want to just talk about our doctrine okay you know our doctrine our doctrine actually is that which eventually is going to become substantive reality 
Now, it, actually, those who, who live by faith, we, we have actually entered into this in the first fruit sense. Actually, our, we've actually entered into the first fruit sense of our doctrine becoming substantive reality. See, so, but actually, in the world to come, see, we're going to lay the doctrine aside. See, we're just going to, we're going to live in the reality of what the doctrine has been proclaiming. You see what I'm saying? There's not going to be any need for the doctrine you know, as, as, we, as we know it here. See, we're, we're going we're to actually live in the reality. The, that, the, of what of the accomplishment and, and, and the the awareness of, of what God who God is and who Christ is and what they have done and in our behalf Amen. there are involvements of his will that only the holy angels are able to enter into they do his will hearkening to the voice of his word and within the domain of men so far as his enemies our concern, God's will is ultimately irresistible. Ultimately. Now, it's by his will, actually, that it's ultimately irresistible. Now, I, I just say, see, it's, it's, it's actually, he is actually, it is by his will. Because remember he said, like Psalm 7610, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of wrath thou shalt restrain. See, so, so God's in complete control of it, you know, the wrath of man's, but, but it's by the will of God, see? It's, a, it's, not, it's not on a, it's just, uh, it's not running roughshod through the earth, the, the, you know, the man's uh, will and man's anger. See, this is, uh, it's by the will of God, you know, it's all under his control. And enemies have been given somewhat of a free reign because they are destined to become the footstool of Christ's feet. Remember, that's what in Psalm 110, right? So this is the... Sit, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And for, for God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will. How about that? Talking about the, the enemies there, the beast and the false prophet and there and, and, and to agree and give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. Now that's only God can do that. Only God, see, God is over. This is like, the, like Brother Pat's text there in Acts chapter 2 about the, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. See, God is, he's over all. He's overseeing all of this, see. Now here, this matter of according to the will of God the, uh, and according to his will. Now, this is a, kind of a new uh, line of thought for me, a new area of consideration, but you know that... I guess I just hadn't probed into it uh, that much before, but, but you know, when we talk about God's will, there's actually latitude. When we talk about his will, there's latitude for the operation of his saints. See, he's, we're not, see God hasn't called us to be robots. He, we, see, the, what, he got, see what, the ones he's calling to, be, to glory are not, are not robotic in nature. Not like, like God pushes a button and they do this, and he pushes another button and they do that. See, they, they actually think like God. They have the mind of Christ. And so, so there, we have this latitude that's within, that's within the, the bounds of God's acceptability now. See, we're, this latitude where according to the will of God. See, the, now let me, just, uh, let me just read you some of these texts to, so you'll see what I'm talking about. He said, uh, having the mind of Christ implies this latitude being given to the redeemed personalities. So think about this. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto the Father. How about that for latitude? See, there's a, see just, just whatever you do. Just whatever you do. So, and then, uh, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God. Is there a legalistic way to do that? Is there a certain path that I have to take? That I, is it a, a certain designated path that I have to do that? Or, is there, or are there, is there some latitude to work there? You see what I'm saying there? That suffering according to the will of God. Now, if you've suffered according to the will of God, you'll be glad to know and to know about and consider these things. You know, that, uh, that, this, that there is, the, the, the latitude in the bounds is that which glorifies God. See, it's, a, it's, it's, it's that which brings glory to God, but there's latitude here. See, God is, you know, from the beginning, he said, let us make man in our image, right? God isn't cre he hasn't created us to be robots. He's, 
He's created to be, us to be like, like him, who are able to reason and, and to, you know, to, to, to move and, and to, uh, to, to glorify his name, you know, by, by actually by, because we have the mind of Christ, see? Amen. All right, so, uh, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything, anything, according to his will. So now, do we have to have a list of what's acceptable? Did you, you ever seen a list of, these are, did, did Paul ever give us a list? Now, these are the acceptable things that you can pray for, okay? You know, and he, he lists 20 things that are, it's, it's all right if you pray for these. No, no, see, this, this, we're talking about this familiarity, this personal familiarity with the will of God. See, if you, if you ask anything according to his will, if you're operating within the bounds of his will, just, just ask. See, you just ask. Just ask him. See, and, he, and God, God's ears are open. His ears are open to anybody who's asking like that. See, anybody who's operating within those bounds of, 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 of tenderness to God and, and wanting to please him. See, it's, it's, not a, it's not a rigid, we're not talking about something rigid here. And then he said, uh, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. How about that? When God talks about his will, it's associated with good pleasure. You know, the, uh, in Psalm 53, remember, this is one of the hardest uh, texts to, to, to comprehend, you know, and it's one that we don't want to just gloss over, but... He talks about, but God, the, uh, the, long about verse 10 or 12 there, let's see, let me see if I can call it up here. He said, uh, but it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Amen. It pleased the Lord. I'll tell you that, I'll tell you that, let's just be frank about it. It, it God didn't take delight in bruising his son. I mean, that from, from God, see, there's a sense in which he, see, God, you, you, if you see what I, where I'm coming now, see, we're, we, have to, we, have to, we, have to, we have to look farther when we, when we think about a text like that. See, God, it pleased the father to bruise his son in view of what the suffering was going to accomplish for the, for the outworking of his purpose. See, now, God, God doesn't have any delight just in bruising his son. You know, it just, he doesn't take delight just in bruising. You see what I'm saying? Let me say this, uh, I had this verse here, his, uh, his deepening cries, I can't think of all of it now, were heard before angelic thrones. The Father said, go strengthen Christ, the angelic Seraph bow, bowed his head and left the realms on high. The astonished seraph bowed his head and left his deepening cries. He's, I can't think of it all right now, but I, I have it somewhere. Okay. Anyhow, it's talking, this is the, the way the poetically expressed when, Je, when the angel appeared unto Jesus, strengthening him, right? So. We run out of time? Okay. Well, let's talk about doing the will, doing the will of God now. Doing it as it applies to us now. So let's let's just think about that now. We've talked about these about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the holy angels and their involvement in the will of God. And but uh, let's think about this. The question must sooner or later be asked: is the will of God in fact, doable by men. Is it doable? Is it, I mean, after all Paul said about not being justified by faith, you know, and not by the deeds of the law, is the will of God actually doable? Well, I'm telling you that it is. I'm telling you that the will of God is doable. God talks about it too much, about doing the will of God, and Jesus talks about doing the will of God too much, you know, for so but, so, but let's talk, we're going to talk about what's involved in doing the will of God, okay? So, 
So anyhow, doing the will of God in Scripture is to be equated with obeying the gospel and by God's grace bringing oneself into conformity with the purpose of God in Christ Jesus. That's doing the will of God. Now you see. Now you've heard. Of, we've you've you've heard in the Scripture about the the uh, the his God's will. You know the uh, the exceeding um, abundance of his uh, greatness of his will. See now now see now as the you your uh, our objective is to bring ourselves by the grace of God by faith by obedience to the gospel. Of course, that's the only, it has to be on that basis. See, but we're bringing ourselves in conformity to God's will. Now, uh, Paul uh, said, uh, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That's from the larger perspective. But from the closer perspective, he said that you should abstain from fornication. Now, that, now see, that wasn't just, it wasn't just fornication that Paul was aiming at by that. See, this was, uh, sanctification is a much larger work than just abstaining from fornication. That's just, uh, that's rudimentary, right? That's rudimentary stuff, just abstaining from fornication. We're, see, we're, we're talking about a very large work that we're involved in with, when we talk about sanctification. Yeah. And, but with regard to, to those created in the image and likeness of God and to those who are in covenant relationship with him, especially now in the present time, the recipients of God's great salvation in Christ and, and their relation to the will of God is unique. They are in a domain where God's will can be resisted, at least for the moment, and where it, it can be delighted in by some and totally rejected by others. It's only in this domain. That's the only, this is the only place where that can occur. We've got, we've got personalities that delight in God's will, and we have others that have completely rejected it. All right, so let's just move on here. And Jesus, remember, he said, uh, whosoever shall do the will of God implies that uh, some are, are doing it, in fact. Whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. Do you want to be Je Jesus' brother and sister? And you want to be identified with Jesus? Well, these are the ones that are doing the will of God, right? Amen. And then, uh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And then, uh, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Now here's in John, he says in uh, his first epistle, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Everybody else is going to perish. Everyone who doesn't do the will of God is going down into the pit. See, that's so we're talking, so here, so we're talking about, so we're, I guess we're, what we want to say here is that you want to make sure you understand what doing the will of God is. See, you want to, you want to have, you want to have a good understanding in your heart about what doing the will of God is, that you actually are among the ones that are doing the will of God. And then there's this, uh, he said, uh, now we know that God heareth sinners, but if any man, this is the blind man, if any man be a worshiper of his and doeth his will. How about that? The blind man even knew that, right? Him he heareth. And then in Hebrews 10, 36, there's a sense in which we've already done it. He said, for you have need of patience, after that you have done the will of God, that you might receive the promise. Now here, do, doing the will of God is receiving Christ, obeying the gospel, see? After you've done the will of God, you need, after you've done that, see, you, have, you need of patience. Just, just hold on your way. After, after you've, taken, after you've received, received the Savior unto yourself, see, you just, you just hold on your way and just keep cleaving unto him with purpose of heart. You just... And then uh, we have, uh, just in closing here, well, I'm, well, we'll just close. We'll just close it here pretty quick. David, uh, after, his, 
after he had served his own generation by the will of God. I'm just talking about serving your own generation by the will of God. Now, David, in spite of his sin, in spite of his moral failures, in spite of the, with, with Bathsheba, in spite of Uriah, in spite of the, his sons, you know, he, David was a man after God's own heart, and he served, he served his generation by the will of God. See, and, we, and, that, and here I'm not bringing re reproach on David by saying this at all. I'm just because David, is a, David was a, is a man after God's own heart. See, with David had the, has the mind of God about, about his, uh, this matter of forgiveness and, and his regard for sin. See, David is, so we're not reproaching David when we say this, but I'm just saying that doing the will of God here is a, is a, is a, larger, is, is a larger thing than uh, maybe, maybe we've uh, considered before. I'm, I'm just going to, I don't, I, there's too much, there's more here than I thought. So we'll just, uh, I want to just, uh, this matter of knowing his will. See, it's uh, knowing his will. You know, we're, with regard to, to God's will, we're, we're not robotic in the sense that, well, God just plops the understanding down in your mind. But, but he, he actually summons us to, to proving it, to, to prove and to, so that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, so, so you're at your entrance into the will of God, see, your understanding is being made fruitful. Your understanding is being exercised. See, you're, you're, a, you're actually involved in this all of the way. See, you're, you, so... Well, I'm, I had uh, had some more things to say, but I, you know what? I'm just gonna, um, I'll just, I'll just, I'll publish it, and, and you guys, you can, you all can, not you guys, but you all can, re can read it, uh, read if you want to, you know. So I'm gonna stop there, and uh, so thank you for, you know what? You know what? I, I I know that it takes, just like it takes energy to, to speak, message. I, it takes energy, to listen, and to be patient. Uh, a patient listener, so I, I thank you for thank you all for your patience.